have the technology. We can rebuild it. For some, racing is in the blood. Peter Hutchinson definitely comes into that category. How else could you explain the desire of a jockey who has come back from life-threatening injury on more than one occasion? He's come out of an injury and forced retirement to ride and win again, only for injury to claim his career for a second time. This time, it's for good. But as he looks back on his racing life, he's remarkably upbeat. From a little boy, little toddler, um, I used to go to the races with Dad in, in England and, and go and sit in the jockey's room with him and, and just had, always wanted to be a jockey. That was the thing, I was always going to be a jockey. Never really um, did anything about it until I was about sort of uh, about 11 or 12. But always had that in my mind, I was going to be a jockey. Even though Dad used to say, you know, you never be a jockey as long as you've got a hole in your ass. <laughs> Why would he say uh, that? I mean, he's, oh, he's bred you, he's a yeah, well, champion he's, jockey. Yeah. He's, he, he used to say, you're too bloody lazy. Right. He said, you, you're that lazy you think mow the grass is a Jewish informer. <laughs> <laughs> when I go to hospital, they, they always say, and what other injuries have you had? And I said, do you want me to start at the bottom and work the way up or start at the top and work the way down? Well, we'll, we'll, start from the, we'll start from the bottom. I've got um, my left foot, I broke my ankle. The right foot I've broken two or three times. Uh, I've done the, 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 the right tibia. Well, now I've done the, the left tibia good and proper. Uh, the left knee, I've uh, chip bones and ligaments. Um, that, was from the, that was actually from the Cox Plate fall. I've had a hairline fracture in my pelvis. Uh, I've I've had two spinal injuries, two bad spinal injuries. Uh, I've uh, collarbones, done both collarbones, elbow, wrist, my right hand. I've had facial fractures and fallen on my head a couple of times. You couldn't tell. <laughs> so, uh, is any parts okay? Is everything working? I, it, it's all works very quickly and very slowly. But uh, I, I'm like a, I'm like a human barometer. I can tell you when the, when there's a change in weather coming. With my career, it has been just just the incredible highs, but, but incredible lows with it. It's just been, uh, yeah, it's been a roller coaster. So what about what uh, we call the career highs? Well. Winning a Caulfield Cup, obviously, is the, the, is the top of the mountain. Um, but also, you know, the, the, the other the great group races along the way, um, Water Boatman, the first group won, uh, winning the Adelaide Cup. That, that, uh, that was a, a huge thrill. Um, the rise to, sort of, sort of to the top in, in Adelaide, winning premierships. Um, and, and yeah, those great years through the uh, through the the early 90s, the mid 90s, and and also you now the the job's taken me all over the world. That's, that's the I've, I've seen places that, that that most people would only imagine and sort of could, could only dream about. And then the lows then? Ah, oh, the the lows. Well, all the injuries. Um, I've you know that it always seems to be uh, when something's Good's happening, or 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 I or something good has just happened. Bang! Something something will put me out of business and and um, put me on my ass, and and I've got time to think about it while I'm convalescing. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so many times, like after winning the Caulfield Cup, a couple of days later, uh, I got thrown off a horse that, that's similar to this accident, and actually ducked out the gap, and uh, I went straight over its head, land on my ass. And basically snapped in the middle, end up in in hospital nearly in a wheelchair with a spinal injury. So you know you go from yeah you, know, you go from the the greatest race of your life to to nearly in a wheelchair a couple of days later. It's a, it's a leveller, a real leveller. How would you describe racing then, from your point of view, to, to someone out there, given your experience? How would you describe a, a racing life? It's a thrill. That that's the thing. Like, when I retired, uh, it, it, sort of my first retirement, um, you don't realise until you don't do it 
what you're missing and and uh i think it was one of the it's one of the things when i did come back to riding again and you yeah, get back on a horse and get back in and more so get back in a race uh that adrenaline rush and that that thrill you get and and the thrill you get from a from a winner Western Red has taken the lead on the outside, drawn two lengths in front now from Coachwood and Destriero, and then along break the Navajo Flash, but Western Red kept going, and Peter Hutchinson racks up a double. It doesn't matter where it is, if it, at the moment you, you stop enjoying a winner, you, you, might, as well, you might as well give, up, uh, give the whole game away, but, because it doesn't matter where, where I've ridden a winner, I get the same thrill whether it be the, at the back of the sort of, uh, on a dirt track in the middle of nowhere, uh, all winning group races at Flemington. How are you, Ron? Fantastic, eh? Hey, fantastic. What a jockey, eh? What oh, well, a jockey. Hey, side by your lines, it must, it must carry exactly. through. Yeah, exactly. What did you say? What? Well, whatever I said, it was all right. <laughs> so why didn't you give it away that, that first time? The beginning about 2002. What had happened, I'd had a, a shocking run of injuries. Uh, I think I had, at one stage there, I had seven accidents in 18, in 18 months. And the last, uh, the last injury put me out of business for 14 months. And, um, and what would happen, each time I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd come back from a fall, um, you'd build up a, a little network of, of horses, uh, you'd do all the work on them, you'd get, the, get them to a point where they're all ready to go bang, bang, bang and win. And of course, down I'd go and uh, hurt myself. Well. The horses have still got to go on. Someone fills in, they take over the ride, mm. they win on them. And when I come back, you can't go and say, oh, by the way, can I have my horse back? It's, uh, you know, you've got to start from scratch every time. And, and of course, after, after seven, uh, seven accidents and the last one, um, yeah, for, after being out of it for so long, and then, well, then I, I uh, got a job up in Macau, had, had a three month stint in Macau. When I came home, the, my support was, was gone. There was no, nothing, no one behind me, um, only a couple, of, a couple of die-hard sort of supporters uh, uh, that, that stuck by me, and, but it wasn't enough to, uh, to sustain a career, really. At the time, I think we were, it, the riding fee was, was about $100 a ride. Um, I was doing track work six days a week, unpaid. And it got to the stage where I was probably having five rides a week, earning five hundred dollars. It was costing me more than that to mm. doing a job that could kill me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So the the the, num the numbers just didn't add up. So because was it a hard call to make to yourself though to say or... heartbreaking? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely heartbreaking. But it was just uh, um, the common sense with it. I couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel unless unless I managed to snag. A, a, a fluke uh, group horse, or, a, or even a good city horse, would have been mm. would have been enough to you know to to keep me going. Um, but I couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel, so yeah, begrudgingly I, I gave it away, and and um, yeah, it, it it broke my heart. It really broke my heart. And this time, now you, you can concede that it's that's it. Well, this time I'm, I am handling it a hell of a lot better. Uh, this time, the, the first time was my, my own choice. Uh, this time, the choice has been taken, just ripped away from me. Um, I, you know, the, I've got no say in it, and for some reason, that, that seems to be easier to, easy to handle you know, when I've but, just got to get on with it. But you've still got that passion, though, haven't you, for the sport? Oh, yeah, that, that, that'll, that'll never leave. Each year, they'd break the records that they'd set themselves from the year before. Injuries are part and parcel of racing, but Hutchie has had more than his fair share. They've never been trivial injuries either. He's been through the pain barrier from head to toe. The day after I'd won on a, a young one, threw me to the shit house at, in track work, gone straight over its head and landed on my back, and and uh, oh god, I was I was sore, and I've, I've got home. And uh, I went to the toilet and was peeing a bit of blood. And I thought, mm, this isn't too good. I think I better. I was feeling pretty ordinary. I think we better go and 
go to the hospital after all. And at the time I had a, a bit of a cold and I was getting this awful bunged up nose. I thought, I've got to get rid of this muck out of my nose. So I've got hold of the hanky and just given it the most almighty blow of all time. And all of a sudden my face blew up like a balloon. And what had happened, uh, I, I had a, a hairline fracture in my eye socket that was <laughs> leading through to the, from the sinuses. And when I blew my nose, the, the air was going through the, through the fracture and filling my face up with the, literally like a party balloon. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, oops, we, we better go get this checked out. So I went to the hospital and, and they had a lot of student doctors in, in there at the time. And, and one after the other kept coming in to, to have a look at this, this freak show. <laughs> And I, I couldn't help myself, I just said to the one poor girl, she's coming very apologetically, do you mind if I come and have a look? And I said to her, I'm not an animal, I'm a human being. Because <laughs> you started your time in England, didn't you, with? Yes, I, uh, I started, Ray took me down, brother Ray took me down to the, to the local stable when I was about 12, an old, um, old jumping trainer, Jack O'Donoghue. Right. And Jack was, um, oh great, he was, he was probably 80 odd at the time and uh, uh, he, he only had about sort of like, like half a dozen old steeplechases and, and, but his stable also had, had uh, ponies and donkeys and cat, cattle and chickens and it was like old McDonald's farm. <laughs> And uh, so I learned to ride on the on these ponies. People used to give him ponies and say, "If you can break this mongrel in, you can you can keep the bloody thing." So I I I learnt on all these rough ponies that actually taught you to ride because they they weren't easy rides. Mm. I think I think my first morning, the first day that they uh, they put me on one, the pony dumped me twice before I got out of the stable gate. <laughs> So it probably really set me up for, for what my career was going to be like in the future. But, but um, and uh, yeah, and and the donkey used to ride. The the donkey was a was a champion uh, champion show donkey. Absolute uh, magnificent animal. And and the, the quirky thing about it, he could show jump. He, he could jump better than the ponies. And uh, we. Uh, one stage, a couple of years later, we took him to um, to a, a professional donkey race meeting, Wivelsfield Green, <laughs> and uh, put him in a hurdle race, and I won a hurdle race on him. Age? Uh, I would have been about 14, I reckon. Yeah, so about 13 or 14. A lot of people wouldn't know about P. Hutchison. No, no, won a, won a, ju a jumps race. <laughs> I don't. And I only won that because the kid that was ten in front fell at the last. <laughs> <laughs> I got up and got up and got the money. You got a bit of better tutoring though after that, didn't you? Yes, you went, I did. You went to a great stable. I went to so well, Jack. Jack started me off, and then uh, when I was about fifteen, uh, Jeff Lewis uh, just retired from riding. Jeff who'd won the the um, the English Derby on Mill Reef, and uh, he, he started training at Epsom. And so I, uh, I started to go to, to Jeff's in the in the school holidays, and and uh, and he uh, sort of got me on. He I upgraded to the racehorses there. <laughs> but apprenticeships um, in England, I understand, are a lot different to what an Australian apprenticeship might be. You're not really uh, given much of a hope there, are you? No, no, no. The apprentices at the time, I don't know whether it's in, uh, changed much these days. But Things don't change much in England, but back in the time, this is the sort of like the uh, beginning of the 80s, and um, yeah, the you, the apprentice was basically the, the the yard sweeper and doing all the dirty jobs and having back at night filling up water buckets and and you don't get much of a go. Mm. And when it comes to uh, it comes to getting your license. You don't have to ride in trials or anything like that. They just give you a license and they put you in a race. <laughs> and uh, I remember the, the Jeff was at one stage was going to say, he said, oh, I think we'll, we'll give you a, a ride soon. I thought, oh Christ, I, th I was thinking to myself, well, I've got no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I just wasn't ready for it. And, and, uh, and I, yes, I was hopeless. I, was, I wasn't, wasn't picking the game up very quickly. Do you and, remember your first ride then? Uh, yeah, well, I well, I, I didn't. I, this one, I, I made the decision to come to Australia, right? Because John Murray, um, 
old Adelaide jockey that, that rode up, was riding up in uh, Malaysia with with Dad, uh, was staying with us at the time, and and uh, he he planted the seed in my mind. He said, well, "Why don't you go to Australia, and now uh, ride in barrier trials and 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 a, had apprentice school at the time as well?" And that got me thinking, and you know, I, I decided that we'll, we'll defer riding in England for a for a while and I'll go and have a year in, in Australia and and learn the ropes here. So of course dad was the director at Lindsay Park so mm. so it was a natural progression. I went to, to Colin Hayes at Lindsay Park. The latest star at Lindsay Park stud isn't a horse but rather an apprentice jockey. Peter Hutchinson has only been in Australia since 1983 and is fast earning the reputation as Australia's premier apprentice. And that's even against glamour boy Darren Gauchy. When it came time to come home, uh, Colin said to me, so why don't you have a couple of rides before you go, before you go home? So I thought, well, if I'm going to have a, a couple of rides, it means I go back to England halfway through a season, which is probably not... Uh, not ideal, so I thought I might as well stay for the for another year and and uh, and sure enough, at the the end of the my first season riding, I was leading apprentice in Adelaide. So I thought, bugger, I might as well stay. <laughs> so I didn't intend to stay here originally. I I only came out for a bit of experience. I wasn't sure whether my weight was going to hold out, mm. or um, you know. So I just wanted to give myself a bit of time. And uh, Mr Hayes uh, asked me to stay when, when I was about due to go home. Riding for Lindsay Park, especially through the 80s and the, was through the, uh, the glory years when each year they'd break the records they'd set themselves from the year before. Mm. And uh, I was, was uh, managed to go through that system as an apprentice and then, uh, and then uh, later on in the late, uh, late 80s, when Jimmy Courtney was the number one rider in Adelaide, had a had a terrible accident and finished his career, and I um, I stepped into his shoes as the number one. So I just got that beautiful ride on the Eagles' back right the way through. Because so. David would have been there then, of course. So yes, in, in the craft, and uh, you know, two young blokes at the time. Yeah, you and uh, and David. That's it. That's it. Yeah, David. Uh, yeah, David was the he took over when CS. Well, he was running the show mm. for. Uh, for most of the time that I was there, Peter Hayes was was in charge in the early days, and then decided he wanted to go and do his own thing. So David took over as a young pup, <laughs> and uh, then when CS retired in it was ninety, I think, wasn't it? The, yep. That 1990, he, he retired and David took over, and that's when we really hit the big time. <laughs> Water Boatman goes to Double Jim. Double Jim, he's fighting back. Fight, son. He fights back, Double Jim. Water Boatman got him. Water Boatman, Double Jim, dead heat again. Adelaide Cup, your first group one, obviously gave you a massive thrill. Being the, the first group one and the hometown cup, that was the, that was the you know, the, Mm. It was a thrill. It was a thrill, and, hard. and especially the conditions. To uh, he beat Double Gin. Uh, we beat Double Gin, who was the like the poor man's Vaux Rogue. Mm. Used to go out and, and set a cracking pace, and only a, only a three year old too. And and I used to feel like the villain, the the, the man with the black hat. I'd, I'd just get up and do him on the line every time. He was hard horse to get past, but I Water Bowman just seemed to get that bob in, and uh, we'd win each time. And of course. The, yeah, the, the Adelaide Cup was no different. Uh, we had a ding-dong head-for-head head battle from probably from nearly half a mile out, from 800 metres out, and, and cleared away from the rest of the field, and, and I just got the nose in right on the line. That's hometown versus Adelaide, but of course Melbourne was good to you. Cannon Eyes winning a blue diamond. Yes, that was the... Uh, yeah, that, uh, through that time I'd won the Adelaide Millions, I think, on, on Cannon Eyes. And uh, we went to the... Uh, came over to the blue diamond. We had a stable mate, Razor Rhythm, was the, was the star of, at the time, the star two-year-old. And uh, I remember Michael Clark was, was riding Razor Rhythm. And our pre-race plan was Razor Rhythm had a lot of speed. Um, she was just going to jump and run and lead. Uh, Cannon Eyes was the more of the staying type. I was just going to sort of hop out and build up and, and hopefully finish off. Well, as, as it happened, 
Rose Rhythm was slow out, and I think I actually jumped and jumped quick and knocked her down. <laughs> and next and I'm stuck in front, Rose of Rhythm's out the back, and all the way through the race, I was thinking, they're going to kill me. They're just going to kill me. <laughs> well, he just kept going yeah. and uh, got the money, and, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. We, uh, we went on with him to the Golden Slipper, and very unlucky in the Golden Slipper, drawn off the track and never got closer than, than about seven deep the, the whole way through the race. Um, I probably could have got, got in closer in those days. I didn't care who, who you killed in the race, but the trouble is I would have had to knock Razor a rhythm down to, uh, to, 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 to get in. Would have got a beautiful run and would have won, but I would have had to knock the sable mate down, which I wouldn't have been too popular. So I was stuck, uh, stuck off the track beaten half a length by Terse, who mm. subs subsequently had a positive, a positive swap. They still didn't get it. Still didn't get it. The only time a positive swap's ever kept a race. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, was, was it you were part of the big day, the, the Lindsay Pope, like Planet Ruler and yes. Mount Olympus? Yes. I, um, um, I came over to ride Water Boatman in the, in the Cup. Water Boatman had run, we'd run second on him in the Caulfield Cup. Really good, really good sort of hard finishing second. Um, and so I came over to, to ride him and I, I got in David's ear and said, I'd love to have a ride on Derby Day, just, just to get my feel around Flemington. More likely, just as what I just want to get amongst the, uh, <laughs> the, amongst the action. And, uh, we, it put me down on Mount Olympus, which I'd won the Murray Bridge, uh, Gold Cup on, um, um, before. And he wanted to put me on Planet Ruler, but the the owners uh, weren't too too keen about it, so they booked Damien Oliver. Well, Damien uh, had double booked himself, and Bob Hoisted, uh, the other horse that he was on, refused to let him off. So David didn't even consult the owners; he just put me down <laughs> on him. So, and sure enough, yeah, the, we, we, it was just one that incredible day where everything just yeah. fell in, into place. Um, Planet Ruler uh, came from, from near last and stormed down the outside and got the money. I thought that, that was pretty good. But then to finish off with Mount Olympus winning as well. To a, actually, when you look in hindsight, to a very soft uh, Kingston Rule running second. <laughs> a couple of days later. <laughs> yes, yeah, a couple of days later, breaks the, breaks the, 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 uh, the Melbourne Cup record. <laughs> Talk about the, the greatest lows of a career. Mm. That, that at the time was the, you know, the, the greatest low I've, I've ever felt. I've got uh, O levels from 1982, which I don't think qualify for much these days. So basically I'm a 47 year old with, with, uh, with no qualifications only a good work ethic and uh, yeah, and willing to learn. So, anyone got a job? <laughs> Just about ready here, waiting on superimpose. Naturalism's gone in. Rough habit is set in 12. Muirfield Village 11. Better loosen up 10. Prince Salieri, Palace Rain. Super's gone in. And the field ready for the WS Cox Plate. One of the most famous races of all time is the 1992 Cox Plate, the big field. Everyone remembers naturalism falling, but you're on Palace Rain, and perhaps a different story to tell. Being a natural lightweight in those days, well, I used to work pretty hard on it at that time to get my weight down so I could ride a three-year-old if there's a, if a good one popped up in the, in, the, uh, in the Cox Plate. So the year before, I'd ridden Chortle and at 48 and a half, and um, it didn't do me much good because of the thing bled and finished off a, a sort of a furlong last, but uh, yes, yeah, so it was just wasn't a good day. But um, uh, Palace Rain, I think it won the, the Guineas that year, and it had been um, a, a very wet spring. Uh, the tracks we've been running on, on bog tracks, and um, David, the, the Cox Plate day that, that day was the first dry track we'd had all spring. And as David was legging me in, on in the mounting yard, he said, uh, he said, Look, don't worry about this. He, he said, this is a horse, is a seriously good horse. He's not just a wet tracker. He's, he's got a, a real life chance in this. 
So, um, sure enough, I got the, the best run of, of all in the race. Things are going really good. And the old Mooney Valley had some rules to follow. The first rule from the, the school side of the track is to give yourself an uninterrupted run. So give yourself daylight. Didn't matter if you're, if you're 10 deep, didn't matter. As long as you're, you're out in the open and able to start going forward. And so I uh, got down to the side. I pulled out from behind burst and and slid up alongside her, and I was going really good. <laughs> and so I think, how good is this? I said, I reckon I can win a Cox Plate here. And actually trotting into it, and next thing the bloody thing fell over. <laughs> I'm heading towards the ground. Like, what the hell happened here? <laughs> there was no reason I didn't clip heels. Perhaps when the horse might be tiring or, or let's say, the going might be a bit sort of uneven, but not when it's a good track and, and the horse is absolutely travelling. You don't expect to be falling over. Because everyone who watches that Cox plays it, I oh, it and was going to win for sure. Yes. Yeah, but my theory is he would never have got a run. He... Uh, he, he, because he was following me through, obviously waiting for me to drop off or, or, or to weaken, which I wasn't going to do. Mm. I would have been right in the finish. If I, if I didn't win, I was going to be right there. And uh, so he would have been stuck behind me. And, of course, the, the other horses all on the outside who had all pulled out to give themselves the uninterrupted run, you've, you've got uh, Let's Elope, Better Loosen Up and Superimpose. All these old times all hanging under pressure, so they would have kept it as tight as tight. And, and uh, yeah, I think if naturalism hadn't fallen, he would have been stuck behind a wall of horses with nowhere to go. Isn't it an amazing race, you think of it? It's a great story that Superimpose won, mm. but everyone in that race has got a story, good, bad, or, or something about it, haven't they? Exactly. There was only probably, it's probably only about three or four lengths covering the whole field mm. in the finish with the interference. Yeah. So... It was just was just an incredible race, even with the with the drama of the fall, but the the drama of the finish with with uh, Charles on Let's Elope knocking everyone down and <laughs> and uh, tightening uh, tightening Bed Loose and up and and Kinjate up and. Yeah, it was just, uh, it had so much drama. Down the outside, superimpose. Let's all open the middle. Prince Salieri getting a run. Better loosen up and superimpose. Let's all open front. Superimpose driving. Super. I think super and nose to let's all open the Cox Plate. Now, even the Caulfield Cup story with Fra is not as simple as it sounds as though turning up on the Saturday and, and winning the big group one mile and a half handicap. It was at the time, uh, at the time where I, I was losing a bit of favour with the stable and... Uh, the, they were, they were looking for, for excuses to to give me the heave ho, and and sure enough, on the Wednesday, uh, the Wednesday of Caulfield Cup week, I presented it to them on a plate, and uh, I was riding Marrakis uh, in the Coonji handicap, and uh, David was very keen on the horse. He said uh, he said this thing could win. He was thirty to one, but can win, and sure enough. Uh, I had the race shot to pieces, and uh, but the horse was going to qualify for the for the Caulfield Cup three days later. So the, the last thing I wanted to do was was flog flog the ass off it to the line, and and uh, I wanted to give it a softer win as possible. And it was going to the line really strongly, so I just put the whip away and rode hands and heels. And uh, sure enough, Silk Ali jumped out of the ground, got me right on the line. Just as we've, we've hit the line, it's got its nose in front. Well, I was absolutely devastated. Talk about talk about the the greatest lows of a career. Mm. That that at the time was the you know the the greatest low I've I've ever felt. And sure enough, we got back, and David wouldn't talk to me. And CS CS got me down in the uh, sort of on the way down to the jockey's room and just tore absolute strips off me. And uh, but uh, I, so the next day, um, uh, David was, was was a lot brighter. All all seemed forgiven, and um, the on the Friday night, we, we uh, our great owners Peter Devon Les Gordon had a Rotary Club, Calcutta, and uh, we went to the uh, we went to the to the Calcutta, and and Ray Benson was emceeing and got me up on the. Uh, up on stage, and and we went through what I was riding on the Saturday, which uh, I had uh, had a full book, and I was going through the through my rides, and 
And I glanced over the table and I saw CS glare at David and David just sort of very meekly shrugged and said, these bastards have, have done me here. You and thought sure, you'd lost the fry ride. Well, sure enough, I got the paper the next day and because uh, the riders those days went in like just the day before. So uh, I got the, the paper the next day. I was taking off everything that I was riding bar fra. And the reason was that the the rides were declared for fra for the for the cup on the Wednesday before my indiscretion. So I basically went into the uh, into the Caulfield Cup, not only trying to win a Caulfield Cup, but trying to save my job as well. That's what, that's what you call pressure. <laughs> Take us through it then, because you you came through. Well, it it was just one of those uh, one of those things uh, that, that everything went perfectly. Every group one race that I've ridden in, nothing's ever gone to plan. You know, there's always something will happen somewhere along the line that's that's going to to make life a little bit difficult. But this race just went perfectly. The old Fra was a was a shocking barrier rogue. Uh, but he went in the gates, um, he jumped beautifully. We ended up uh, like seventh one off by the post the first time. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Jim Walker, the right in the favor of Phantom, uh, he was back on my inside and, and uh, we, we got, to the, got to the crossing. And I said, looked over him and I said, geez, we've ridden these a treat, haven't we? <laughs> and, and it, it just it, it was just perfect. I just got the the best run you could ever imagine. Got to the got to about the half mile, just working into the race beautifully. I had um, uh, it was, what was the filly that uh, Paddy Payne was riding that I knew was was going to take me into the race, but probably wasn't going to run the trip out. So, but it was going to go well enough to take me right into the into the straight. And I said, I was thinking to myself at the time, gee, I can't believe things. Are, this is going so well. The last time things are going this well in Group One was the Cox Plate when the bloody thing fell over. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, sure enough, uh, we got into the straight, hit the front, and just hung on on the line because the, uh, I think Fra barely got the mile and a half. He he was just as, that's as far as he ever wanted. And he was better over 2,000 metres. He was a, he was a strong horse, but probably a mile and a half. Just saw him out, and and I I got the bob in there right on the line. And uh, so I think I've got it. I remember pulling up and and seeing one of the track men, and and they've given me the cheer and said yes, you got it. And coming back and seeing that number seven up in the uh, up in the frame. Oh, that's it. There's no feeling like that. And how was the uh, the Hayes team when you came? Well, back? old CS met me at the gate. And I just said to him, am I forgiven? He said, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> when you work with horses, it's when you get hurt, not if. The wind is blowing pretty strongly here. I've got, um, I've got a bit of uh, help, though, to keep me down, apart from the big fella standing on one foot. Um, <laughs> it's working, it's working. <laughs> I said, I don't, want to, I don't want to lift my arms up because I'll take off like Mary Poppins. <laughs> One of the saddles who was making the, uh, the equipment for me said to me, just said to me in conversation one day, said that he, he was getting requests from people wanting um, custom made sort of tie up stuff for the boudoir. So I said to him, is, is there a market in that? And he said, oh, I don't know. So I went and researched it, got on the net and researched it. Yes. There, there is a market for it. So I, so I had the idea we, we can just do a little spin-off from the, the horse equipment. And I, I registered the domain name and... Uh, Which was? Uh, uh, Thegamesbond.com.au. <laughs> Bring out the gimp in you. <laughs> or trust me out before you go-go. <laughs> Let's talk about the time you, you went away from us. Yeah. This is 2002. You've got to survive, though. What, do you, what, what were you doing? Uh, I, I had, had a go at uh, real estate. I got, to, I got my uh, sort of uh, uh, real estate licence. But the trouble was I, um, 
uh, I was with a like a, a small company, like a, basically a, I was the, the sole employee, mm. and I uh, I couldn't get a listing to sell a to sell a house. I could do an appraisal as good as anyone, and uh, <laughs> the trouble is every time you, you go and I do the appraisal and you get three quotes and and the the hocking stewards. Uh, the the Hodges or the and the Marshall Whites would would put in a uh, an appraisal, and who are you going to go with the 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 small company for the bloke that you know has only been at five minutes, or do you go with the established company? So I couldn't get a listing, and uh, uh, that made life a bit difficult. But um, I met Kevin Bloody Wilson not uh, while I was an, an agent, and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I was a jockey, but now I'm a real estate agent. I said, I've, I've been in the game three months and I haven't sold a house yet. And he said, oh. he said, where do they post you? The Nullarbor? <laughs> 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 so that was a, so I had my, my three months as a, as a real estate agent, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, no, nah, it's not for me. I, so I, I moved away from that. And I did a lot of, um, around Carnival time, I did a lot of, uh, a lot of the marquee hosting and, and running punters clubs. Mm. It was a very good punters club uh, uh, sort of captain. Um, Jockeys are bad judges, Hutchie. We've learnt that. <laughs> <laughs> There's an art to punters clubs, though. <laughs> right. And I'm not riding them. <laughs> it's, um, no, it's very... So I, d I did a lot of that. Run, but that's any sort of... A lot of that's very seasonal, mm. you know, the... the uh, only around springtime. So uh, I also had a uh, had a company selling horse equipment on the internet, uh, a web-based company, and uh, uh, but that only just sort of marked time. Didn't uh, sort of didn't go backwards, but didn't go forwards either. So it just gave me something to uh, to do and kept me ticking over. But it wasn't sort of nothing really grabbed my imagination. Now you say you're not a punter, but in yeah. your house here has got the record quality payout from Ember Stakes Day, one point whatever it was million, and it's got your name as a winning ticket holder. Yes. So, in the off season you took up the punt. It was while I while I uh, was retired and I'd be hosting the Marquees um, through Cup Week, and of course Stakes Day is Dad's big day. Yep. Where he presents the uh, the Ron Hutchinson Trophy to the jockey of the carnival, and uh, the family go up and have a big day up in the committee room mm. that day. And of course, but I'd always be working um, somewhere else on mm. course. So, Mum had been at me for a long time. And I'd love you to come up to the have have the, uh, the the day in the committee room. So this year, I thought, oh, well, I'll take the day off and we'll do it. So. Uh, we go up to the committee room. Dad pulls me aside and he says, now, he said, now you behave yourself when you come up here. He said, these are my people, not yours. He said, none of your loud laughing and your rude jokes. <laughs> so yes, Dad, okay. So we sat down for, for lunch and brother-in-law Nick uh, said, we'll, we'll do a, a, a table quaddy. There are 12 of us, right, huh? 12 well, us on the table. There are uh, 10 Hutchies and Ray Selkrig and his wife. So we've got and three jockeys on the table. Yeah, and they've all got no idea. No idea. Absolutely no idea. So I said to Sarah at the time, uh, I said, well, "This will be a debacle." I said, "We'll go. And we'll 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 throw in our ten here, but we'll we'll do a little one of ourselves." So, um, so it's not, it's not a big pool you've got here. You've got no, we had, well, ten, and we throw in ten dollars, but they're all having an individual pick. And I said, "This is," and they've got no idea. So you can imagine they'd just be. Oh, he's got a pretty name, and well, I like the colours on this one. These are these are people who actually should know what they're doing. <laughs> tears I cry in front, and tears I cry with a boil over. This is tears I cry. But tears I cry wins the first leg at hundred to one. Yes, yeah, so with all, we're out here. We, we, we're done. So Sarah and I wander off to see some friends down on the lawn, and next we get a, a, a phone call after the next leg. We're still alive. Hidden strings hard on the fence, two lengths in front. From out wide, Sovereign Miss running on is Denethay, followed by Can Canal, but Hidden Strings will go all the way. Hidden Strings wins the money. Hidden Strings, 80 to 1. Yes, you're kidding. So we, we, we dash back up, and of course, by this time, the Dad's words of you behave yourself are going straight out the window. <laughs> I'm running around the room going, ah! Live in the quaddy. <laughs> we were live in the quaddy. Zavit in front, Sifalu tries to rally back, but Zavit. Zavit wins just over a length, Sifalu. 
course, the third leg gets up. There's a vote. And uh, we get the, the approximates for the, for the last leg. We've got six horses alive in the last. Yeah. We've got 6.7% of the, uh, the quaddy. And <laughs> the approximates were ranged from like 3.2 million to, to 500,000 was the, was the worst, worst result. <laughs> and six alive. So I think we've got a good chance of something bobbing up here. Well, sure enough, the thing gets up. Gets the money. Montechuro starting to pack it back. Still, Mustaher the leader. Montechuro on the outside, getting to it. Mustaher. Montechuro dived and made it very close. Survived a protest as well. There was, there was a protest. No, <laughs> 1.2 million. <laughs> so for for a, a day out, we uh, I think we got we got 90,000 between 90,000 between 12 of us. Fantastic. What a great so story. So it was the the biggest result of all, all time. And of course now they'll. Family will still go back there and try and do it every, every year. I think the next year, it costs them more money than they actually they got it, but it costs them more money than they uh, to get it than they actually got back. So um, one point two million. So I think it still stands as oh, probably yeah. the biggest the biggest dividend uh, to date. So uh, yeah, so we've, we've got that on on the wall to to remind us. Fantastic. But uh, we got it above the dishwasher that it paid for. <laughs> What was it like coming back into racing after such a long time off? I, I got very uh, got got very heavy when I when I uh, gave it away, and it was probably one of those things you know you you watching it sort of all your life really. Although I was you know in my young days I actually had a good app very good appetite, but um, um, when I dis when I retired, the first thing I went to was went through the Hungry Tracks drive through. One by the why the hell did I do that? You know, it was just oh, you know, give me something healthy any day. But um, I got uh, got fat and got up to around about seventy kilos and uh, threw all, all my old skinny clothes out the window because I couldn't imagine my, me being skinny again. So um, I, at the time, I was doing. A, Bit of work for, for Sport 927, mm. doing a bit of promo work for, for them. And they, uh, they had a client, uh, uh, Jonathan Holmes, who had dietetic weight loss. And uh, they weren't having much luck with their, with their ad campaign and wanted a, a guinea pig to do the program and do it uh, sort of Biggest Loser style. So mm. each week I'd... Uh, I'd, uh, I'd do the program and I'd, I'd document what I was eating and what I was losing and all of a sudden the, the weight was dropping off and uh, I'm he healthy and feeling a million dollars because the best I've ever felt. So, uh, and after the races, we, I'd, uh, or go to the races and after the races I'd, we'd go around to uh, Robert Smurden's for, for a drink after the race and he started getting in my ear planting the seed about riding track work. And, uh, and I said to him, at the, I said to him at the time, you know, if I start riding track work, I'll get stupid ideas about making a comeback, you know. And he said, oh, don't worry about that. He said, I, we'll put a stop to that. He said, I won't put you on. <laughs> Rock shaft in front, going strongly, 100 to go. Got away from 16 Pelicans, the Edgecombe and Prima Luna deep out, but Rock shaft won it well. We started back with the bang, because um, that's exactly what happened. I started uh, riding track work, and, and then after a while, a few jump outs, and, and, and I was going to be light, and I'm going to be fit, and why not give it a go again? And, and, and that's what we did. So I went and got the ticket back. I had to do my 10 trials. I said to, said to the stewards then, can I claim three as well? <laughs> Hutchie comes across and uh, has a chat to me. Congratulations, a, a speedy, but most importantly, a professional two-year-old there. Yes, Richo, he's got a, he's got a, he's a bit of a thinker. It's a little cult. I think uh, probably when he comes back into work next time, he'll have a gear change, testicles off. But um, <laughs> The ultimate gear change. Yes, definitely. <laughs> no, not for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> the first few months were very successful. Rode, uh, rode I, think, I think, the first six months of the comeback, rode about 19 winners. And then uh, we, I went off to, I'd rode, just ridden my first city winner. Uh, Miss Matari at Caulfield, and round about uh, it was round about Christmas time. Actually, the same sort of time I'd, I did this injury. And um, on the Monday, I think it was, went off to Stony Creek. Had three rides there. 
three good rides. I had won the first two, and the third one was my best ride. And coming around the home turn, all of a sudden got a little bit of a wobble up, and I thought, I've, I knew, I knew the signs, because I've, I've had it happen to me before. The thing is having a heart attack and just dropped dead underneath me. And uh, well, I think I might have actually watching the replay. I, I might have done the old Superman and bailed out because the you know, I know it's not good when they have a heart attack. You don't want to go down with them because they go everywhere. Yeah. So I think I've done the old Superman off the side, but uh, knocked myself out, and and so I don't actually remember the fall. But uh, but uh, you, I thought I thought at least I'd be you know if I give me a, you know a cup two or three years before I start having falls again. But no. <laughs> They started again. So how many falls do you reckon you actually have had? Don't know. Don't know. I, it, it's, a, it's a hell of a lot. It's a hell of a lot. I, I, you know, couldn't, I, I couldn't, can't actually put the, the number on, on how many. The... At some stage you expect them, though. That's the sport. Well, you can't, yeah. That's the, that's the thing. It's, it's a, when you work with horses, it's when you get hurt, not if. Mm. So, and, and in competitive racing, you know, horses move and and there's no there's no bumper guards on them or anything like that. You're going to clip heels and you're going to fall. You, know, you love travelling, but yeah. I don't think you ever thought you'd be riding at the end of your career as Newman and, uh, and Roeburn, although they would have yeah. been great thrills for you. Oh, great fun, because through the sort of late 90s, um, I'd, uh, I'd go to all the country cup meetings all around the country um, because I, you know, I was good value because I can get up and tell a story and make a function a good night. So, so the clubs would uh, would invite me. I'd go up, have a full book of rides, uh, do the Calcutta's and, and the functions and tell a few of the old bad gags. All true, though. All true, yes. No embellishment whatsoever. And uh, so I, I'd, uh, I'd spend a, most of my time actually riding all, all over the countryside, and uh, but loved it. You know, if I can get on a plane and go somewhere, it's like, it's like having a holiday, but you're still working. It's, mm. uh, it's fantastic. So um, that was a part of the the job that I really, really enjoyed, and uh, and of course then. Uh, when I came back to riding, those sort of things didn't happen anymore until I got the, uh, a phone call from from the Robin uh, Robin Jockey Club and inviting me up there. I was like, "Where the hell's Robin?" And I had to go and I got on Google Earth and 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 tracked it down. It's just about 30 k's from from Karratha, up in the Pilbara, and uh, from what I could see on the Google Earth, a magnificent looking track. It was all red dirt, good yeah, good old Australian red dirt. But a track the size of Bendigo, big sweeping bends, long straight, and uh, I thought this will be a bit of fun. So uh, sure enough, we went and went and uh, did Roban, and and then the following year they invited me back again and, and took and invited Sarah and the little man was only a few months old too. Little Henry was uh, got his first trip on a plane, and we had an absolute ball. And then. Uh, and from there, I was invited to go to Newman as well, which uh, uh, which is was in about 500 k's inland, another mining town, but uh, funny enough, a grass track in the middle of the desert, and it was just great. It was back doing what I love doing again, getting on a plane, flying somewhere, and having fun. Now, trivia quiz uh, contestants for the future: the last Pete Hutchison winner of all time will be from Roeburn, Steel Blue. Steel Blue, yes, yes, won the won the big sprint of the day. <laughs> so I had a good day that day. Actually, I had uh, I had five rides and four in the money. One one winner, and and all the others were all in the money. So it was a good day. This is probably the most secretive and sacred. It's only the little people are allowed in here, but I think if you come with me, I can show you around. Wherever you, you're written about, it's always Peter and the laughing, the laughing jock. Yeah. And obviously you come across that way. Are you a naturally happy sort of bloke? Yeah. Well, you've got to. I always say, if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. But you've got to, you've got to be positive. And I can always, I can see the positive in, in most things. You know, there's always a funny side to something, even even the worst tragedy. There's a. You know, there, there is some, there is, you, you, there is a lighter side. You can make a lighter side of it. But if racing's tested one person on that, oh yeah, it has it. And this is, the, and this is the, the dilemma that I, 
that I've had too. Uh, they, you get the rep reputation, I don't take it seriously. Well, that was far from the truth. The fact that I enjoy what I'm doing is, is the reason I smile a lot. Because if you can't, and if you can't show that you're, you're happy when you're doing something you love, you now what, you know, what can you do? And the the times that I that I wasn't happy, people would say, oh, don't put him on. He's not himself. <laughs> So I, could, I was in a no-win situation. I'm either too happy and don't take the job seriously, or I'm, or, or I'm not happy. Well, not himself, and <laughs> so yeah, it was a catch-22. What do you think racing's at? So, say with a, a bloke like you, you've come to the end of your career, not of your own choice. Mm. Has racing set itself up well enough to look after its own people who have been good to it? Yeah, well, yes. Well, like a, like a day, like, like to, today is a, is a. Is a sort of like um, it's quite overwhelming, really, the, the the support that I've had since since this injury. Um, you know, it's it's overwhelming and humbling because I've couldn't I couldn't imagine the the the, the amount of support and backup that I've that I've had this time around. So you know, the the, the industry is full of great people. And that's the great thing you've met. Uh, you've been so well loved by all the racing. Mm. You've got close to so many people, and a lot of people probably don't even know you were close to you. Mm. Um, you must have met some great people along the ride. There's there's been plenty of characters over over the years, especially uh, especially from the early Lindsay Park days too. No, I'll give, a few up the... then. give a few up. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to give too many too many secrets away. But we back in through the through the eighties and the the old Lindsay Park days before the days before political correctness and and uh, and uh, yeah, sort of harassment laws and that sort of thing. Well, we had a lot of fun. Well, it's a different life now, isn't it? Uh, meeting Sarah late in life and father of Henry with with one to come. What's going on there? Yes, poor Sarah. Sarah never signed on for the jockey thing. Um, we met. Uh, we met when I was a little fat ex-jockey, and in fact, when we first met, she didn't actually believe that I was ever a jockey because she can't remember me winning a Caulfield Cup. So apparently, she was overseas that year. <laughs> but um, we met at the uh, we met at the races, and and uh, and probably sort of became an item. Probably six months later, and and uh, yeah, so she. I remember that very first day her face appeared at the window. She wouldn't go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a very good girl. And, and uh, yeah, so when we when we decided, uh, when I decided to do the, uh, you know, to, to make the comeback to, to riding, I don't think she was was too impressed because um, um, during the EI, I did the, the interviews on the pony of Caulfield Cup time for, uh, for Channel 9. And uh, Sarah was was very nervous about me riding old banjo. It was, it was 22 years old at the time, and and fa fair enough, he's an he's an old prick. But uh, <laughs> but she was very worried about me riding banjo, let alone coming back to to riding in a race. <laughs> so the poor bugger has uh, through the uh, through the last few years has uh, has actually never seen me ride live. She watches the replays afterwards. <laughs> We well, become so, very critical of my riding too, by the lot of the time. So well, why did you go there and not there? That's going to stop now. Dear. <laughs> yeah. And what's Henry meant to, to you? Well, I wanted to. I've always been uh, been a dog man. I had my, my two dogs, Barney and Lulu, and and of course they they got old and and died on me, and I wanted a puppy. And then Sarah said, uh, said she she's getting on and and. And didn't want to die wondering and wanted a baby. I thought, oh Christ, all oh, well. And I was never, ever, ever going to have a children. In fact, I think I've done a really good job all these years from dodging the bullet. I was doing the high five. <laughs> and um, so we actually, uh, yeah. So we, we actually, because of our age, uh, Sarah was 40, 43 at the time, and so getting on a bit. So we really didn't have time to. Uh, to mess around, so I thought well, we'll go and do the the IVF and and cheat a bit and just make a good thing of it. And sure enough, uh, the little man was born, and and he's just a, a a little superstar, funny little kid. He's he's just at the stage now where he's uh, where he's crawling and finding his voice. So uh, yeah, very loud little man. But um, um, 
I don't think he'll be a jockey. He, right. he, he's a, he was a decent size. Um, now, when he was born, he was eight pounds, and and uh, and I don't know how I could produce such a a, a big baby because I'm only a pony. I was just, I was the size of a good poo when I was born, and <laughs> and Sarah's only not not big either. The fact that he's black too concerns me, but um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, he's he's a. Uh, I think if, if by another 15 years, the, if the weights have gone up to about uh, about 60, 65 kilos, he might have a chance. But uh, oh, you could be back by then. You, well, you never know. <laughs> yeah, well, I might get another comeback. Nifty Wilson's got nothing on me. <laughs> oh, beautiful. But, uh, but of course, uh, now um, yeah, we, we found out just before Christmas too that, that Sarah's pregnant naturally with a with another one as well, which is which is incredible. And uh, well done. As a forty four year old, she'll be forty five when when the when the second one's born. So yes, yeah, all of a sudden, from someone who who wanted puppies and was never going to have children, all of a sudden I've got a litter. <laughs> it's a litter that needs feeding, and for Hutchie, the hope is to be involved in racing in some capacity. It would be nice to think that the game he gave so much to and suffered so much for could find a place for one of racing's nice guys.